Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. All right. Welcome, Khani. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I'm sure. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, everyone's happy to be here. Look at this place. <laughs> Some people are nervous to be. Yeah, here, I don't think you're nervous in front of a. Do you still get nervous in front of in a microphone? In front of a microphone? No, no, it's where I thrive. That's where you. Mm. That's where you feel most comfortable. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about that. But let me edit, let me edify you first properly. Go for so it. I'm sitting here with Hani Lisman, comedian, producer of unorthodox comedy, mm-hmm. and of a show, a recovery show, on um, I don't know, a podcast. Podcast on recovery called Hi, my name is correct. And um, sober, not clean. My comedy is not, not specifically clean, clean but it right. can be clean if you have a bar mitzvah you need me to go to. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. You, yeah. Can, you can organize. Yeah. Right. Oh, and I'm also sober. Did you say that? Yeah. You did say that. You said sober, okay. but not clean. Because sometimes people will use those words interchangeably. Right. With recovery. Got it. My sober, I'm clean. My clean time is nine years. Or oh, something, I right? feel like the people that say the clean time are the people that are addicted to drugs. Oh, excuse is that an me. Assumption? <laughs> Maybe. <I> <laughs> My clean time. Oh, so is that how it works? So yeah. the people sober from alcohol kind of look down at the people. Yeah, they're like, Ooh, "How's that going? <laughs> sober from no. drugs." <laughs> I'm kidding. We love everybody, obviously. Yeah. yeah. No, everyone gets to look down at the sex addicts. So. That is a fun group. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we know everyone else belongs here too. Not everyone, but a lot of the other ones. Oh my God, I have here. so much to share on that. Let's share. No, let's jump in. Where did you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been to um, that program for a little bit. Say more? Um, I was basically in love with somebody who was not available. And I couldn't stop wanting to be with them and they were like dying of depression essentially and I was like I'm gonna love the depression out of them you know what I mean Mm -hmm. and so I had to go to that program to like get help to like take care of myself love addiction yeah 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 I've seen that it's a rough one yeah but that was transformative in my dating life now because I'm even though I don't go to that program anymore it's helped me so much with like the levels of self-care that I can take around dating so that I can protect myself from that like happening again or you know what I mean by like, self-care the, you mean boundaries boundaries just like knowing how to date you know like some things might be obvious to some people but like you know just having boundaries around you know like there's a lot of numbers like how many dates before you do this you know there's just right. like a lot of structure so I don't, there's boundaries yeah, yeah, yeah. okay I'm not in the program anymore just saying but I learned a lot and it was amazing and I right. have a lot of experience with like people that I know that are in recovery for that. Right. I have this theory, it's not completely like foolproof, but that men who struggle with the same thing as, as women, so men will say, I'm a sex addict, and women will say, I'm a love addict. Yeah, because true? there's, yeah. But because I read the book and I was like going to the meetings, at, when I would introduce myself, I would, I would say the full thing just so that I didn't um, separate myself from the group. Right, understood. Right, just so I could be a part of, but... There was a part of me that was like, are you? I don't know. You know, like, I don't, I'm not a, I'm a raging alcoholic is what I am. <laughs> raging. Ra- you like, still feel that way? 100%. And you've been sober for? I've been sober for 16 years. So why do you say raging? That's... Because I know you give me one drink, that person is right, right there. I know that. I know it in my gut. Like the minute, the, my first night sober, I acknowledge to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic. And if I drink again... It's not because I stopped being one. It's because I just stopped caring. I just know I'm an alcoholic. It's nuts. It's the one thing, as much as I know that I'm a Jew, I'm like, I'm a Jew and like, there's nothing you could do about it. Like, that's how I feel about my alcoholism. It doesn't hinder me from having like a great life, but it's just like, this is who you are. Right. Is it something you think about? No. No, it's just, it's off the table completely. You mean to drink? Yeah. Oh no, I never... Thank God that obsession was removed. Got it. But you I, still know you're an alcoholic. Yeah, yeah, I do a lot of things every day to protect my recovery. Right. Every single day. Right. 
It's crazy. People would be like, no way. Like, it's insane what I have to do to leave my bedroom. Can you give some example? 100%. Yeah. People are going to be like, that's insane. Number one, I sleep with an alarm clock. There's no phone in my room. There's a journal by my bed. There's books. There's like three recovery books and a big book. And I read and I journal before I do anything. And then I pray and then I meditate and then I go on Instagram. What's like crazy? An, because it's a lot. Right. I'd like to adopt that. It's changed my life. It's, 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 it brings me closer to Hashem immediately. And um, it helps me to be centered in my body. It helps me to remember what my motives are throughout the day. Like, you know, it just, just gets my thinking straight every single morning. So a lot of people who I speak to thinking about program or not thinking about program because they have an issue with it, right, a recovery program, one of the two issues I hear, which is kind of one, is why would I call myself an addict? Mm. all the time why would i go into that doesn't it bring me down yeah and the other which is connected is why would i say i'm powerless wow yeah i hear that a lot from people that they struggle with that they struggle with the idea of that being helpful to them why would i embark on a program where i'm continuously referring to myself as an addict or continuously reminding myself that i'm powerless isn't that the opposite of of healing don't i want to build up my confidence and build up who i am so how would you address that Yeah, um, if I think that I can do something on my own, then there's no need for me to get help. I, I, does that make sense? Like I'm, I'm working with someone now, working, I'm, I'm sponsoring someone right now who, if I'm not powerless, then what am I even doing here? For me, I have to be admit to myself that I can't do this on my own in order for me to get the help. The, the help that what I'm talking about is like the work. Why, why would I want to do any of this stuff if I can do it on my own? When I did it on my own, I, I, was ended up, I ended up drunk every single day. So it's like my way doesn't work, and I know that. I could try. Maybe in 10 years I could be like, well, I haven't had a drink in 30 years. Maybe it'll be different. I don't plan on doing that. I'm not under the false idea that, like, because it's been so long, I can now drink. My brain is the same. I, I, I still, like, at parties will be like, why didn't she finish her drink? You know what I mean? Like, how did, my sister will have three sips of a glass of wine and then put it down and be like, I'm buzzed. I'm like, so drink more. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I just, I have the, when it comes to alcohol, it's, my brain just works differently. And you find that helpful yeah. to you? yeah. Yeah. And the powerless angle, which a lot of people talk about. It doesn't make me feel bad to say that I'm powerless. So it doesn't affect me at all. I actually write it out every single morning in my writing. I say, I'm powerless over alcohol and my life has become unmanageable. It doesn't have a negative connotation for me. For me, it brings me closer to God. I'm like, God, I really can't do this. You've seen what happens when I'm by myself. It's bad. Please help me. Is this, is this something you feel like is unique to you or across the board all addicts? Oh, interesting. I don't know. I think you do have to come to a place of like, I can't do it before you can move forward. And, right. And admitting powerlessness. Do you think people, other people don't mind it as much no, as so I that, do? That I agree with 100% and I've said it many times is that there definitely has to be a, a step of of. I am powerless. I cannot do this on my own. I am an addict and recognizing that fully. Whether someone has to embrace that forever. Right. Perhaps some yes, some no. I mean, we, I interviewed someone on the, uh, on this podcast who was sober, let's say about 18 years uh, from alcohol and drugs. And uh, eventually through ayahuasca, he, many, many journeys and several years on that path, he got to a place where he said, I'm no, longer, I'm no longer an addict anymore. Wow. And uh, I've been with him drinking. Because I don't, wow. I, I drink, I'm not a, that's not my. You don't my have problem. to brag. I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> I'm saying that's not my problem. People yeah, ask yeah, me all the yeah. time, oh, you, you, I go, oh, 12 steps, recovery, could you drink? I actually just had that conversation with someone on the way here. He was talking to me. He was in uh, AA and GA, 
And he's like, oh, how does it work in the S programs, the, the sexual recovery programs? And there, can you drink? I said, yeah, I won't get drunk because if I get drunk, then... Yeah, I think it depends on the person. I think direction. each person creates their own circle, right? Of like Yeah, behaviors. around sexuality. Right, around, yeah. around sexuality. People yeah. create their behaviors. And it, right, one of my circles that I had was like kind of the circles, the idea of things that can lead me to relapsing. Mm -hmm. One of those was getting drunk, but that's not the same as having a drink. Right, right, right. Okay. So how did I get there? In any case... This uh, oh about the fact that this person had eighteen years and then decided that he could drink. No, he didn't decide that he. could I'm drink. saying that decided that he's not an alcoholic. Right, that's a distinction he makes. Right, that he's like I I never decided that. So I didn't decide that I can drink through a number of ayahuasca ceremonies. Ayahuasca said I'm okay. I'm not. An okay, anymore. that's amazing. So for he him. was. He's like you're okay now. He said, no, I didn't make that decision. I know that may sound weird. Oh, 100%. I'm, like, I'm just like, mm -hmm, for sure, for sure. No, it sounds fully crazy. supportive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just wouldn't do an ayahuasca journey because it's not in alignment with like, I just, it's mind altering, right? It's everything altering, yeah. Yeah. So I don't do any of that stuff. But also I have no desire. Like when I was drinking, I never wanted to do shrooms to have a trip. Like my neurotic self doesn't that doesn't sound fun it doesn't sound like i need that kind of healing i have a trauma therapist you know what i mean like i'm doing the work right do i have judgment on people who do it no <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we can we can talk i about don't know that. you know what i mean i'm like oh my god i've been in trauma therapy for like 10 years not 10 years but like you know what i mean i'm like it's hard i'm having shifts i'm having you know breakthroughs they don't happen overnight right um, yeah, I guess, I guess I had a similar experience, not exactly the same because it wasn't drinking, but I had a similar experience. So as part of my recovery, I s stayed away from a lot of different internet sites. Correct. Right, being addicted to pornography. And for a while that included Instagram. Oh. And... I mean, Instagram is like this close from a porn site, or could be. It's very, very, it's very close. And it seems to know. You know? Yeah, they know. They know. They're like, oh, it's Ellie. Here we go. <laughs> She's like, what? I have to call my sponsor again. Oh. Right. They know yeah. I was thinking of buying a tent today somehow. Yeah. Right. And anyway, so I had that kind of out of my life. But then as I started doing this podcast and sharing more, I found that that was a great vehicle to connect with people. So I started using it in different different ways yeah and even till today i use an app i use an app called opal o-p-a-l and okay. it puts a timer on there not so much for a sexuality reason just to not get lost yeah so it kicks, when i go in i have to set a timer how long i want to first I before you go that. in yeah it's a great app o-p-a-l pay like 80 bucks a year and it saved me hours because what happens is is you can't i can't go into instagram right away i first have to go into the app and unlock instagram and then depending on how, much, how many times I've used it in that day, you can have different settings. It may make me wait five seconds, no time at all, or sometimes a minute and a half. This is how I know I'm addicted to Instagram because as you're like, it makes you wait. I'm like, no, that's <laughs> not a way to live. <laughs> I, I got kicked out of my Instagram like two years ago. I had like physical withdrawals. It was harder than quitting drinking. Yeah, I'm not joking. Instagram is right. I was miserable for two weeks. I, I read somewhere that- I was like, Shaking like a heroin addict. <laughs> yeah, right. Instagram, Instagram is to women what porn is to guys. Yeah. That's. Yeah, I mean, sure. Sure, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, Great. Right. I'm like, yeah, as if I know. I just know, f f for me, I, yeah. there are two different parts. So today I'm careful with it, and just in the sense of not wasting time. And yeah. I us I'm usually going with some intention. I want to post something. I want to respond to messages. That's where if people want to get in contact with me yeah. and they don't have my information, that's the best way i won't read facebook or the other stuff so yeah. Insta instagram is where it's at and then i can't go in there you have to set how long i'm going in there for when i go in and you can't exceed 15 minutes so at 15 ever minutes, 15 minutes you can't ever exceed more than 15 minutes so you get kicked out no thank you you can set windows right so you can set i only want that from nine to five you can wow you can set different windows different rules and if you need to go how long have you been on this app i mean six months do you see a difference in your life it's much better. That's what I'm saying. You probably have a great life. <laughs> yeah, but my technique for working for um, using Instagram before this 
was deleting the app and re-downloading it every time I, oh, I wanted to do something. Okay. So it wasn't a major shift, but it's a little bit more convenient than that. Yeah, got it, got it. So, yeah. And that, obviously, I didn't always do. And then sometimes you can get lost for 45 minutes or an hour, not, not meaning to. They're very good at introducing It only dopamine. happens at night for me. It's like, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to get an early night. I'm going to get an early night. I'm going to get an early night. I'm like, damn it, it's 1230 again. Right. So you can, for example, set a rule that I never want anything past 11 o'clock till 7 o'clock. It automatically kicks me out. And it gives you those parameters of going in, something like that. Anyway, I, I don't want to be a All salesperson right. for the app. What I, so what you I, own the app? No, I'm just <laughs> so what I was referring to, it's funny because once I'm actually behind something, I feel very weird talking about it. So I'm only very comfortable talking about something when there's no, when there's no benefit. Really? Yeah, in the same way. Yeah, like we did this retreat with Mayor Kay. Yeah. And normally like I'll, if I think something is great for someone, I'll recommend it to someone. And I'm on the phone with a guy and I'm like, okay, like this guy would really benefit from the retreat. But then through my head, I'm wondering like, is he going to think that the reason I'm saying it is just because I'm involved with the retreat? Uh, so then I'm like, oh, you know what? Maybe I won't recommend that. Is that a problem? I mean, no, but did he end up coming? No, I didn't recommend it. But you could have had someone else. Okay. That was Alanonic of me. Yeah. Right. We did the right thing. Okay. For sure. In any case, yeah. <laughs> No. Not that I make money on the retreat, but right, 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 right. But yeah. there still is money that comes in, right? Right. It okay. doesn't end up in my pocket. But okay, I, I wasn't that... even thinking about money. I was just no. Uh, that that was the idea. But it's also not about money. It can be about yeah. Hey, I think you'd be a real great guest on the podcast. Like I wouldn't sell that too hard. I'd just invite someone. Oh, uh, okay, got it. Anyways, so back to ayahuasca. Oh yeah, that's what have you doing. done it many times. Do you like it? Ayahuasca. Yeah, my first love. Are you joking right I'm now? I'm not joking at all. Interesting. Yeah. The only parallel... The only, Your this, first love? That's yes, a strong yes, statement. Yes, very strong statement. Wow. Yeah. Maybe I do want to try it. No, I'm just I'm, kidding. I, I would lose my I, I don't know if this is sacrilegious to say, but the only parallel I have for someone who grew up Chabad to explain to them what, what ayahuasca, ayahuasca is... For bringing with the Rebbe? Yechidus. Oh. Yes. A Yechidus for... So it's a private meeting with the, with the Rebbe. Yeah. Wow. Meaning, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying it's like that because I've never done that. What I'm saying is, is that the way that is spoken about by people who've been there. Yeah. The, that is the only thing I've heard that the feeling that I felt that person was trying to describe. Yeah. I've used similar words to describe. Um ayahuasca ceremonies and there are a lot of things about it the preparation and who ayahuasca is with and there are other aspects to it so i'm not ayahuasca with anyone anytime for everyone right. easy but i'm not an evangelist for it but in terms of my own life and transformation is tremendous yeah wow that's amazing so during one such ayahuasca experience it was explained to me that my explained to me shown to me became a weird to me whatever word someone said yeah. ayahuasca said to me it can, uh, some people yeah. use that language. Maybe a better language is you feel like you're in a state of total clarity. Okay. And I've when heard there's, that. Right. And when there's a thought that comes to you, it's... It's pure. It's, right. right. It's yeah. pure. You're like, in this state, I'm thinking this way, like yeah. that's clean. And you know it with certainty. Like this wow. is a clean, clear thought. And the thought was that me continuing to refer to myself as an addict while it's helped me for so many years, where I stand today, it's unhelpful. And the example that was, cl that was kind of used by myself to, to explain yourself, that to me, or yeah. by Ayahuasca to explain it to me, was that when on Instagram, if I saw a picture that was illicit or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I would be more likely to get lost in that, saying, oh, I'm an addict, so of course I saw a little bit, and then, you know, what am I supposed to do? Or, right. you know, it can, it can attach itself a little bit longer to mm -hmm. me. Even if I don't stay with it, it can attach itself to me a little bit longer because of the thought that I'm an addict. Whereas here, it's like, no, I'm not. I'm a person with choice. And I, am I, I, am I going to make the choice or not make the choice right now? Uh, and I haven't lost my choice. Okay, so, so that's just different from the, like, psychology that I come from. It's just like, we've, for me, I've lost the power of choice. And I said that for a long time. That's what I'm right. saying. And here it right. was explaining to me kind of the dark in side. The, in the ayahuasca. Yes, the dark yeah. side of that. Yeah. And, and for me, continuing to say that to myself about, it was specifically yeah. about sexuality. It couldn't really be used with um, 
alcohol and drugs, I don't think there's a clear parallel because there you're cutting it off completely. Right. So there's no reason ever to, to interact with it. Right. And in this, sometimes it happens that it's like, okay, you're walking down the street, there's a billboard, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. So before... Probably not leave the house, that's on you, you know? Right. Yeah. And, you know, I was once... <laughs> you live in Miami, it's like, what I was do you just expect? once doing a house showing with my wife and we walked in and throughout the home, there were probably like seven or eight pornographic pictures and they weren't nudes. It was Supreme Court Justice who said, um, I can't tell you the difference between nude photography, like the art nudity in art or nudity yeah. in pornography i can't describe it to you but i know when i see it so this was clear <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. a legal opinion so yeah. this was clear this was um clearly nudity like yeah. very aggressive nudity and it messed with me the whole day for a couple days wow. and part of the reason like there was a little bit of the it messed with me and then i allowed it to mess with me for a lot longer than it probably need to because of this thing I was telling myself that I am an addict. So now I have permission to be affected by this for three days and I have a good story to attach to it because I'm an addict who doesn't have choice once I Got it. engage with it, Got even it. unintentionally. But let's say you went to the same house after you had that ayahuasca trip. You think you, were, you would have been able to just be like, okay, that was something I saw and then just move on? I have had those experiences, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I have had those experiences since. Where, not that there isn't, there is an effect but right. the effect lasts as long as the effect. Do you know the story of the, um, and then we'll go back to think because I'm talking too much, but there's a story of a chassid and a misnagid who's walking down the street and uh, they see a woman drowning. So the chassid jumps into the water and grabs the woman out and, you know, puts her on the shore and continues walking. And two or three blocks later, mm -hmm. the misnagid says to the chassid, I understand how you were allowed to do that, had, you know, touch a woman or, Chairman Nagia, how are you allowed to touch someone else? You could just pull her out of the water like that. So he says, I hear what you're saying, but I put her down three blocks away, three blocks ago. Why are you still carrying her? Mm. Right. So that's what I mean. Like that carrying something. We can, mm -hmm. there's the image and the effect that it can have on us. And then there's, yeah, we can carry it for many blocks or days. Got it. So. That's a great story. I've never heard that. That's so it's not intense. a real story, but it's... you made that up. No, it's not a story. It's a parable. It's, Got it. You know. It's a parable, but and still, I, I'm sure the parable sometimes chassid. Why are we making him a misnagid? I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> we're chabad, right? But it can also be. Um, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. You know, in London, in England, they may say, you know, uh, an Englishman and an Irishman walking down the street. Right, 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 right. Got it. Right. It's just a way of. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. An appropriate way of dealing with something in an appropriate Got it. way. Got it. Yeah. If you see someone drowning. Save her. I'm not that great Save a swimmer, her. honestly. <laughs> they don't want me there. I just learned, I taught myself how to swim this summer. So mm. it's new for me. I swim now like three, four times a week. It's amazing. It's life. I love it. You taught yourself this summer? Yeah, I'm 40. Is everybody listening? 42. How did you teach yourself? That's so awesome. I know. Um, I just, okay, it's a little embarrassing. I was watching a TV show on Netflix and there was a life, there was like a swim coach and he was teaching someone how to do it on the show. And I just like paid attention. And then like two weeks later, I was in my friend's pool and I was like, let me try that. <laughs> I've always been really scared of water. Really? Yeah. And now I have goggles. I have a bathing cap. Like I went <laughs> swimming this morning. I'm probably going to swim tomorrow. I do laps. It's so, so healing. Neat. Yeah. And you just got into this. Yeah. She just found out. I just found out literally um, in, in October. October, November. That's so neat. No, no, no. This summer. Sorry. I, I, I learned in the summer, but I joined a gym that has a pool in October. Sorry. Yeah. So can you, can you take me through that process? Because it's actually incredibly inspiring to... Oh, yeah. To see something that you didn't learn for whatever reason. Well, for, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but yeah. For whatever reason. For whatever reason. My parents neglected me. Childhood, childhood didn't present <laughs> a swim teacher. Uh, that was the I least of our problems. It says that a father has an obligation. I know my father. I don't think knows how to swim. I think that's well, you've where this whole him. thing started. Right, <laughs> you've absolved him of. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can swim now. Responsibility so there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Hashem, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I basically every time I would put my head underwater before I watch this show. It was called Never Have I Ever. It's produced by Mindy Kaling, and it's very good. But I would breathe in. I'm so embarrassed to admit this, but that's the truth. Up until this summer, if I put my head under and I wasn't holding my nose, I would, like the, the I didn't know how to. Almost move. gasp. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fully. And how did you get around that? I watched the show and he, 
explains to him, he's like, breathe out like you're blowing your nose. And I was like, no one ever told me that. Oh. <laughs> I know. It's so sad. It's so sad. I'm going to cry. <laughs> no one told me that. They're like, go swim. And I was like, I don't know how to. And now I do laps and I'm doing the brush stroke with my head under. Awesome. Like, it's so crazy. I don't even have to hold my nose. Like, it's a whole new world. I'm not even joking. Right. When I taught my kids how to swim, and they also had a swim teacher, but I okay, was you don't very have to engaged. Brag. No, but that was the first thing I showed. You had to put their, had to put their so face I said, in. So before even putting their nose in, just blow bubbles in the water. Like, can yeah. you blow bubbles? Can you blow bubbles? Can you blow bubbles in the water? Like, blow out. That was the first. Every morning when I put my head in for the first time with my goggles, I'm like, I am, I, I'm, I say it, like, I'm so proud of you. I say it to myself. It's I'm like, awesome. I'm so proud of you. Oh, it's incredibly inspiring because for a lot of us, we think that learning ends at childhood. No. And then. No, not for me. You have your backpack. Listen, I did bring <laughs> my lunchbox um, here. Both straps. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a slow learner. I'm 42, and I can say with like all honesty, I, I feel like I just started living my life like in 2018, like uh, my truest self. What changed? I left a corporate job. Well, what were you doing? I was working in the Diamond District as like an office manager. I got that job when I was 21 years old. I was there till I was 37. It's too long. It's too long. I didn't know how to leave. I didn't think I could. I think I didn't think I could do anything else. And I've been. A, Were you doing like, comedy before that? Yeah, I was doing it on the side as like a fun little thing. I never charged. I didn't acc um, accumulate any time. So like I could do like five or six minutes, but I'd never like took myself seriously enough to be like, go headline somewhere, go do an hour, go do a show. Like I was, my self esteem was not there. Anyways, I'm in a 12-step money program that helps me focus on my goals and helps me be accountable. And because of that program, my career is where it is today and I charge what I charge and I have a website and I have a show, a monthly show that I produce. Like all of that, left to my own devices, I'm like, uh, when is anything going to happen for me? So what did it teach you? What did you learn from this program? Self-worth. Self-worth. I texted you. I'm like, hey, can I be on your podcast? Like three right. years ago, I would have never reached out to you. Why would I do that? You're like Ellie Nash. Like I'm just Hani. Like, we're just people. Right. I don't, I don't have this association you have, but. Yeah, but I'm saying. Be, why, what? why did you want to be on the podcast? <sighs> because I think, I, I mean, I know when I was like in my teenagehood and like struggling a lot, I had a really hard childhood and it, you know, till I got sober, I was 25. I didn't know people that were doing cool shit who were sober. And I think it's important for people who might still be struggling or who are just getting sober to know that like life is long and we can, we can recover and we can do really cool things that we're proud of. I just want to, I'm proud of myself, I think is the thing. Also. So what is the, what is the, the myth that you're busting? What is some, what, what might someone think were it not for you telling them that, hey, you can do cool stuff after drinking, after stopping to drink? Wait, we'll say that again? So what is I asked you why you wanted to be on the podcast. And oh, you said because... I just want to provide hope and connection with someone who might be struggling to like, I don't know, like I'm an artist. I can only paint when I drink. You know, like there's people that like, they struggle with stuff like that. Like this, how am I going to still make music if all I ever did was make music when I was drunk? Understood. Okay, so... I, yeah, if I were, so what I'm here to say is that like, when, when we get sober, we get to be in touch with our like innermost selves on a level that like we, we, we can't even tap into. Like on mornings of shows that I'm like really excited about or producing, my brain wakes me up thinking of new material. That doesn't happen when I'm hungover. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, that's a great joke. <laughs> And it happened for me like three weeks ago when I did a fundraiser for Hatsala and I was like, oh my God, that's a genius joke. And I'm going to say it tonight at the show that I'm on, that you're hosting for me. Thank yeah. you. It's great. But like, I didn't sit down and write it. Like it just came to me. So. And that didn't happen before. So I guess. Well, I wasn't really, you know, there's no tool. 
Right. It's one of the things, one of the definitely things that I like to show as far as recovery is concerned, as far as the healing process is concerned. And one of the reasons I like to talk is that life gets much better. Yeah. Even I've made the exam, I've said the example as well with, um, even with sexuality, where my thought was, if I get sober, if I cuddle this stuff out, it's going to be this, I don't know, what am I going to do, turn into a monk? That was the association right. that I had with it. And other aspects of life, I'm sure you've heard this analogy in your program, that an addict kind of throws all the to- tools, uh, the toys out of their sandbox and only left with one, their addiction. Oh, I never heard that. Oh, That's was, right, no, Jimmy. That's it's kind of what we do. Is like this is useless. This is useless. Oh, this goes with drinking. Okay, I can still keep that one. Uh, right. If I drink, then I can go boating. Right. That's a fun thing. But would boating uh, without drinking? Oh fun? yeah, 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 yeah. No, at the end, sudden, I... right. The only toy left in the sandbox is drinking or something that attaches directly to drinking yeah. that becomes more fun with drinking. And then the lie we tell ourselves because it's the only toy we have left is that we need this thing. Is that if we don't have this, life is just going to be an empty sandbox. Yeah. With nothing. <laughs> yeah. So when I when I first was um, introduced to people that were sober. I was 25 years old. And I remember looking around the room and being like, everybody here is so old. I know that I belong here. I can come back in 10 years or I can just stay. And so I just surrendered. I I still did everything that my friends were doing at the time. You know, I... (laughs) The Hamptons, Vegas, like just like designated driver for all of <laughs> Armin Van Buren, five in the morning, you know, Tiesto, like all that. But I was like, okay, I don't need a drink. I mean, I drank a lot of Red Bull that year. I don't drink Red Bull anymore. Do you stay away from all of like the caffeinated drinks and everything? Yeah. So that's but, part of your... But that's just a personal choice because of my heart. When I drink Coke or anything with caffeine, my heart beats really fast. I think that's what everybody gets from coffee i think that's why they like it yeah i don't even drink coffee a coffee messes with my stomach yeah i don't i don't i also quit smoking in um sobriety got it yeah you're like how does she have any fun (laughs) (laughs) so crazy so boring no i have the best life honestly so but you were at this for if my math is correct about 11 years before 2018 yes yes clicked Yes. So what happened? Besides I, the- okay, so I, I lost a job. Oh, you lost it. Well, I, I left the job to go to a different job, and then I got fired from the job that I had just started. And then I said, okay, I'm not, I'm not getting another job that I don't want. I will never work again for people that I don't want to work for. I want to be excited about what I'm doing. And so that has been my journey. So it wasn't something that... That's interesting. It, it, it was forced upon. It was forced me. on you. Yeah. It wasn't a realization you came no, to. No, no, no. I don't mind taking credit. And I'm you got gonna... really anxious for a period of I, time. I was anxious. I mean, I Airbnb'd my apartment. I would like stay with friends. Like I was like, I'm not getting a job. I will do anything to not get a job. And I made it work. It's cool. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. Yeah. I still don't have a job, but I mean, you know, I'm. It works. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, so I'm like, yeah, of course I'm proud of myself. I was answering a phone for 16 years. I was about to say the company. They were amazing. They should have fired me. I was awful. (laughs) (laughs) I've made amends to them. They were great now. I was there like literally a month ago. They they, um, polished my diamonds for me. Nice. Yeah. You went to make amends and got your diamonds polished. No, no, no. I made amends while I was still working for them. Oh, no, years ago. Oh, this is a crazy story. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Okay, so for many the microphone like, for the many microphone. years, my job was to order lunch for everybody, and they never specified that they wanted to buy me lunch. So I would order lunch for everybody, and then be like, oh, "I'm just gonna get a salad," you know. And then when the bill would come, I would just go to the back. It was just tons of cash lying around. I'd be like, "I'll just pay for everyone's lunch with the money from the back," and so they were essentially buying me lunch for many years, and they didn't know. And so when I was doing step work, I had about three years sober. I brought that up to my sponsor and she was like, oh, that's stealing. (laughs) And I was like, I don't think so. It's just lunch. And so I had to confront them and tell them that I had been doing that. It took me three years to be willing. To tell them. To tell them. And then one day I was praying before I went to bed and all of a sudden the willingness just came in and I was like, I'm ready. And so I 
spoke to my sponsor. We wrote a script, and I went in like three, four days later. How'd it go? Amazing. How much I, was it? Oh my god! If I tell you how much money it was, you're gonna be like, maybe you should stop eating salad. <laughs> it was over seven years. Right. So I guesstimated, and the number I came up with was thirty two hundred, and I paid them back that the following Monday. Yeah. So I made an amends. They they, they trust me. They took it back. They're like, yeah, just put it in the safe. Like they didn't even look. They're like, oh yeah, put it over there. Like they didn't count it. They they just were like, wow, that's intense. <laughs> this program sounds rough. No, but like one of them knew I was in the program, and one of them didn't. So I had right. to make it twice. I didn't have to pay them back twice, but I had to have two different conversations. Why? Because my sponsor said, you don't have to break your anonymity to the one who doesn't know that you're sober. So I just said, I've been doing some work on myself and I realized that I harmed you. I have been ordering lunch for you for many years and you never offered to pay for my lunch. And I've, you know, I guesstimated that I, I took $3,200 worth of lunches. And he was like, okay. I was like, so I'm going to pay you back. He was like, okay. I thought they were going to fire me. They're like, see you Monday. I'm like, oh. you know what I mean? Like, I, I, at that point, I was like, I'm ready to go. I didn't so know how to like go. Not, meaning, I think most people would have predicted it either would have gone really well or really negatively. It was just it like was just nothing. Nothing. But yeah. I felt better. For sure. I can look them in the eye now. I, go to the, I went there a month ago. It was fine. I'm making jokes. I could tell they're proud of me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? No, like, the, amends, the amends is a, is a huge, huge deal. It's huge. I it's thought huge. I would die before I did that. And here's the kicker is that 3,200 is um, I had lost my apartment. I was living with my bubby in Borough Park, and I hadn't paid rent in three months. And my whole thing of not wanting to make the amends was that they're going to fire me. I'm not going to be able to pay rent. And I was like, I don't have to pay rent. I'm living with my grandmother right now. I didn't pay rent for the last three months. This is... God telling me that you're ready. The money's not yours. Give it back to them. That's how it felt. It felt so clear. Right. I had a, a sponsee once in recovery who told me, I don't remember the exact details, but it was a lot more money than he was able to pay. And um, so, which I do. And I said, just tell him about it and start with 20 bucks. Just pay yeah. towards it. You know. And even then, he said he felt better right away. Yeah. Yeah, I think amends is under um, underrated as a tool for healing. Outside of twelve steps, you don't you don't really hear about it. And I've gotten really good at apologizing. I'm like professional. <laughs> My sponsor would always write a script. I couldn't just say I'm sorry. Sorry means nothing. It's like I want to take responsibility for the way I treated you. It was unkind. Like literally, it was like she throws me under the bus and is like, "Is there anything I can do to make it right? Did I leave anything out?" Okay, so In the future, I would like to be a friend who, you know. Right, let's talk about that. I did a podcast. I used to do these podcasts where I shared ideas instead of interviewing. Someone. Oh. And maybe I'll go back to that at some point. But one of them that I, sh I think I called it, Don't Say Sorry. Yeah. And it came from recovery. Yeah. Where in recovery, it was more, okay, make amends and ending it with, how do I make it right? Yeah. And then kind of being trained in that way. And having to go through that experience a number of times. And then seeing it done the other way, it's like, oh, I'm really sorry that. Oh, are you? Yeah. So when people, how do I make it right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've made many amends. And I've also received, because I'm in the program, I've received them from people. And sometimes I'm like, your sponsor let you make that amends like that? Just I'm sorry on an email? <laughs> okay. No, literally, I've gotten those. And I'm just like, sure. I'm like, just go live your best life. You know, for me, it's, and I sound judgmental. I am judgmental. I'm not going to pretend. We, we call it discerning around here. I'm very discerning. discerning yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It's so much better. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm discerning. Yeah. I'm never going to not be discerning. Ayahuasca can help with that, by the way. I'm not going <laughs> to. Can you imagine I call my sponsor after this and be like, Ellie said it was fine. Do you know anyone who's in recovery who does it f from alcohol and drugs? Um, Besides that one friend who's... So I think that's the rub, right? The rub is that it gets um, tough to do both. It's one of the reasons why I left. I don't go to meetings anymore. Not because... I've actually been thinking like I want to. I, like I want to kind of reconnect with some of the guys. A lot of great relationships there. But 
that was one of the challenges was that as plant medicines became such an important part of my life, um, it felt like there was something I couldn't share amongst the group. Everything mm-hmm. was okay except for that. That's what it felt like. But why? You're not even an alcoholic. I know. It's still viewed a certain way. First of all, half the guys are. Meaning in an, oh, S, yeah, 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 in an yeah. S program, yeah. people come in in two ways. S? In any S program. <laughs> no, I'm saying they either come in with the S. No, right. yeah. they, they come in where they cheat on a spouse or right, right. a relationship um, mm-hmm. ends or they get caught publicly or something like that. Yeah. Right? Something in their life gets affected by their sexual behaviors or... Or it could be also a personal one. Like for me, it was more personal. It wasn't caught. But as I was starting a relationship, I saw it was very difficult to stay sober when I always told myself, oh, when I'm in a relationship, I'll stop doing these things. But then I didn't. Yeah. I I couldn't. So then you just asked for help? So I went, I was in therapy on and off for the previous five years. And I went back to the therapist. Mm. And I said to him, I I think I may be addicted. And he had suggested it years before. I don't want to go into the whole story, but he had suggested years before because he had sent me for a diagnostic evaluation. And one of the things yeah. that came back is people with his personality traits could, um, however he worded it, right, could relieve stress to, through sexual acting out behaviors yeah, right, or could cope through sexual acting out behaviors. So he had pushed that a few times, but it was a no-go zone. It was no, 100%, I am yeah. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not that. I just do it because I like it. Right, 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 right. And I have no reason not to. Right. And at the time, I felt like I didn't have a reason yeah. not to. But then you had a but reason. Then I had and it and I couldn't, couldn't stop. Yeah. So, so that's, that's how I came in. And there's variations of that story. Everyone has different bottoms. Some it's... Yeah, some it's bad. You know, it's cheating on their wife for the fourth time. And now their kids are upset at them. Others, it's getting arrested, right? There's some variation of that. Yeah. And the other half that I've... Um, the other way people come into to it is either being an AA or NA or some other program, mm-hmm. and as they're going through their sexual inventory with their sponsor, which is part of the... Sponsor's like, whoa, this could use a little said, double what? take. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure this is your main addiction. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah another one, go down Or you have it the other way, where someone's in the program for like love addiction or sex addiction, and then they're doing a fourth step, and they're like, wait, every time all this stuff happens, I've been drunk, and they're like, I've, I've met people who have gone the other sure. way. yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, programs like, could. I think I might be an alcoholic. Right, programs can definitely get you into yeah. another They're program. Like a, it's like a tunnel for 100%. all the other programs. 100%. So when you're in a space like that and there are many people from AA or NA and it's heavily influenced by that and you start talking about these experiences, a lot of people will use this kind of blanket label, you know, it's mind-altering. Okay. So that's terrible. Sex can be mind-altering. Everything could be mind-altering. Ice plunge is mind-altering. But... Um, you know, Gabor Mate was asked this question, and he said, how can you recommend to people to do ayahuasca? He's a big fan of ayahuasca as well. How can you recommend people to do ayahuasca if you're, you know, you're helping people get off of heroin and other drugs? So he said the way he sees it is it's exactly the opposite of drugs. So a drug is one that you need more of in order to get the same effect. Mm. These medicines, when used as a medicine, a lot of it could be misused. There's no question about it. I don't think ayahuasca can in that way, but um, it's not my experience. But uh, certainly a lot of other ones could. MDMA, mushrooms, et cetera, ketamine could be used in very harmful ways. Um, But when used appropriately for that same effect that someone is looking, the healing effect, they need less. Mm. So someone may do ayahuasca, I don't know, five times a year at first and then may feel like they don't need it for two years. Got it. Afterwards, which yeah. is exactly the opposite of using. You sure, it. you don't work for ayahuasca. <laughs> I told you I don't push anything that I have personal benefit from. But you have it. You, okay. Right. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> got it. And then the second thing Gabo Mate said is that drugs. The purpose of it, the reason, the intention behind it is to escape. Mm-hmm. Whereas the intention behind is medicines, to, when used appropriately in yeah. the right set and the right setting, to feel. is to connect. Wow. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So. That's awesome. It's a completely different. Uh, Did he sit in this chair? Who? Gabor Mate? Not literally, but figuratively, oh, yes. That's upsetting. Figuratively. I Meaning I went up to Vancouver to interview okay. him. But I would have liked you have, to have lied and just said yes, because I would feel better. Right. He's, he's kind of persona non grata. What do you think about that? Meaning a lot of people have been very upset about, they viewed Gabor Mate as a trauma genius. Right. And more than a genius, it was there a father figure for some, someone who was mm. a guide of sorts. And he has that kind of grandfatherly Warren yeah. Buffett thing going on, the wise man on the hill who knows all. 
and um, he's made a lot of statements anti-Israel and for a lot of people, I mean, very strong pro-Palestinian. Really? And for a lot of are they Are they recent statements? Because I, I saw that the statements that people were posting were like from 2014 or something and that it wasn't Right. Correct. So immediately afterwards, there was a segment of an interview with Russell. Immediately after October 7th, there was a segment of an interview with Russell Brand that was pushed very heavily, and that was from several years ago. Right. But subsequent to that, he's made statements that, um, yeah, he's certainly... Have you been in touch with him about it, or no? You just... i spoken to his son, Daniel Mate, a little bit about it. Um, I follow Daniel Mate online. I've interacted with him a little bit about his, uh, some of his comments on Israel. I would say he's a little bit stronger even. I interviewed Daniel as well. Stronger... A uh, pro-Palestinian, yeah, anti-Israel, very strong. It started softer what I was watching, where he felt like he needed to. Um, you interviewed him since October seventh. No, 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 I haven't. Oh. I haven't. I've thought about whether I should. Like, should I? Are you able to like? I don't know. I feel so. No, not 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 Gabor Mate. Um, Daniel. His Mate. son. Whether I should? I, it's not, am I able to? I'm able to ask. Certainly, I can email yeah. Gabor also. But. Um, like should I should I not I've, I've chosen not to because it hasn't been the theme of this podcast either Israel or politics right, or right or even being contentious with someone I usually try to to bring yeah. out I may discuss something like we're doing with ayahuasca where there's clearly um uh which is fine right there's a point that we see that we see differently there but it's not overall I'm looking to um highlight someone's positions not find got it Got it. Now find someone, an area of disagreement, and then right, right, right. someone into the ground. Right. I mean, someone has mislabeled for that if they want to. Exactly. Check that Tune out. in. <laughs> Once a week. Once a week. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I hear you. Um, so. Pro Israel? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but just going back to that point, what do you think about that? Is about. Someone, so looking up to someone. Oh. In the trauma sense, and then them making statements that I'm going to assume, but maybe I shouldn't be so. Um, assume that what? Assumption that he was presumptuous. No, that you yourself are pro-Israel. Oh, yeah. that's a great assumption. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm asking the question without clarifying that. Yes, um, I think for me it was disappointing, but at the same time, I didn't like fully let myself sit with it and internalize it. But at the but also like he's not he's. A very important person to a lot of people. I just started listening to his stuff a little while ago. So it's not like he's someone who I've known and I've cherished and looked up. Like he's just, I mean, I know he's a very brilliant person, but he's not someone who's been an active part of my life or even in my psyche up until this summer. So I was just like, oh, that really sucks. Oh, got it. Do you know what I mean? I was just like, ugh, another one. Like, I've lost friends over this situation. So I was like, ugh, another one. Right. For me, he was a very important part of my... That's very hurtful. Uh, and I have... But I, but I didn't feel that way. You didn't? No. That's amazing. How? How do you separate that? I would love to be able to do that. So I You're, felt you like... You can be close friends with a pro-Palestinian person. I, I'm strugg I struggle with that. Uh, there's a difference between close friends. So let's, let's separate yeah. the two questions. This is, could I still respect Gabor Mate for his views on trauma and not get lost in what I see as his brilliance or his insight in that regard just because he has some ideas on um, the Israel-Palestine issue where I find not only is, I don't only disagree with it, but I find them harmful. Yeah. Is he Jewish? Yeah, he's a Holocaust survivor. He, he's a Holocaust survivor and he's pro -pal Okay. I don't know how to... Like it doesn't... There's like my brain just... Fritz, do you know what I mean? Right. Like, no, I see. I don't understand that, but I get it. Everyone's entitled to their own. Right. So I would say like this is that I had probably an experience that um, impacted me the most was that the way I view this is I had a sponsor in recovery who was really, really, really helpful to me, really helpful. And it felt like until I started working with him, the program wasn't clicking for me. Yeah. And the irony is that the reason he helped for it to click with me so much is that I felt like he, he really embraced spirituality. Mm -hmm. At least, he, you know, he had the language around it. And the other people I was speaking to in recovery, I felt like they glossed over all the spiritual terminology. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, God, doorknob, doorknob's God, right? The higher power, yeah, anything. Yeah. I'm like, 
there's specific claims being made here in this in the 12 steps that God yeah. cares about you, God has a will, you can pray, you can meditate. Right? There's someone there's oh, a doorknob has a will for me. There's a direction right. I turn my will over to what? So there were some very strong statements being made about God that were very spiritual in nature. And until I met this guy, it wasn't jiving. At the same point in time, I hadn't seen anyone else who had the struggle that I had and right. had freedom. And I saw that here. So I was still coming to the meetings, but it wasn't clicking for me until I worked with him. And then um, over time, I found out about some very inappropriate behaviors with others in recovery. And keep in mind, we're in an S program. So as one person says, my, my drug is in the room. 100%. And it was more than that because I had asked him certain questions um, in our relationship. How did you navigate that? Oh, it shattered me completely. That, completely. that would shatter no, shat me. Completely. Because he was the guy that I was looking up to. I'd introduced him to people like, hey, this guy's, um, this guy's amazing. And then one of the questions I asked him um, early on, not that it, it, not that it mattered to my decision, but I thought it was important for me to know, I asked him whether or not he's gay. And he said no, which was fine. I have another, my, my most recent sponsor is, and you know, is gay. And that wasn't, um, it wasn't the issue, but I, I still think it's something to know, right? Am I with someone, am I with a man who's gay? I just feel like it would affect the interactions a little bit more. You can interpret things a little bit differently if someone is or isn't. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think so. For step work, probably. No, for general life, anything. Okay. Or the proximity of a relationship. Or... Well, it's interesting that you say that because I was seeing a trauma therapist for like like two or three years <laughs> and the whole time I assumed he was straight, the whole time, and we were saying goodbye, like our second to last session, and I was like, yeah, and then like, God willing, you and your partner, I knew he was married, I just assumed it was a wife the whole time, and then all of a sudden I was like, are you gay? I've known him for <laughs> three years, he was like, do you want me to tell you? And I was like, oh, you're gay, <laughs> I had no idea, <laughs> and it, I guess it's not the same, but it, I don't know. It would have been maybe a different... He, right. In this context... Yeah. I mean, Sorry, that was a weird S, story to share. No, especially in an S program where... Yeah. Yeah, hey, that's, that's relevant to know. It is relevant, to, relevant know. to know. Yeah, 100. It's relevant to know because whatever, you know, it's just the, the same way, you know, imagine having a sponsor, you know, over paper and not knowing their gender, right? So a female and a male is like, oh, I thought you were a female the whole time. I didn't realize... Well, it's 2023. That. They could... It could be both. Sure, oh, right, without getting into that, those conversations. I don't want to get canceled by myself. Okay. So. Got it. Noted. <laughs> I do, actually. But I do want to get canceled. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get a little bit more famous and then get canceled. <laughs> I want more people to know that I got canceled. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> right. You didn't even get anywhere. Yeah, no one knows that I got canceled. It doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. I want everybody to know. Um, back to the story. So yeah. The, my, um, the sponsor. So for me, there was kind of, there was the inappropriate behaviors with, with others. There was, when I confronted him about it, there was like no responsibility taken, which was kind of a violation of the, like everything he taught me in program. And he guided me so much and helped me so much. And then on top of it, like looking back to early conversations and then saying, hey, and you lied to me there too, because I had asked him, about it. And he's like, oh, everyone thinks that because I'm effeminate. And like I said, it wasn't the main point, but it was, like looking at the whole picture, it was completely devastating for me, completely devastating. Within a short period after that, something I shared in a meeting got back to my girlfriend, now wife. She, you know, she confronted me like, why would you talk about, I don't know, whatever it was. Now it would sound ridiculous because I'm public about everything. But why would you talk about the fact that you were addicted to strip clubs? or something? I don't know, something I shared in a meeting and someone who knew a relative of hers said something. And I was like, wow, this place is not safe. Oh, you wow. Know, so between this happening with my sponsor and this happening. Um, That's traumatizing. Yeah, within the program. It was very, yeah, it was at a very sensitive point in my recover recovery. And remember that I'm answering the question about Gabor Mate, right? So just to hold that, like how I right. was able to, wow. to balance the two. So a short time after that, I left recovery. I'm like, this is... This is nonsense. Yeah, yeah. Right, the sponsors, you know. Not trustworthy. Not trustworthy. The 
meetings itself, the people are not trustworthy. When I confronted the group about it, and I said, hey, like this, this guy, can we, do we still have him in meetings? Do we talk about it? They didn't take it seriously. No. I was yeah. like, wow, you know, strike three. So I just left the meetings. But my recovery didn't get much better <laughs> when I left the meeting. So then I'm stuck. I'm in a situation. So what did you do? Uh, you found I was spiraling at that point. I was spiraling. And at one point, a friend actually he was going to an AA meeting and he called me up. He's like, dude, just, you haven't been in a meeting in a while. Just come. So I came and I started coming back to the meetings. And um, for a while, I just tried sponsoring myself. You know, How'd okay, that I can't trust anyone. Uh, it wasn't great. No? It wasn't so great. Weird. And then yeah. this hilarious story. Okay, great story. <laughs> so, <laughs> great story. So at some point, I said, you know what? I'm going to share my, my first step, which in, in these meetings you share, you, you qualify first at the beginning. It's like if, I'm, if you're struggling, then you'll say, okay, you'll pick a speaker night and you'll share your story. And here it was like my story was I'd come into recovery. I'd grown a lot. I had gotten sobriety. And then I slipped over these things, but now I was regaining my footing. Yeah. And I tell the speaker guy, I'd like to speak. And he says, who's your sponsor? Like, who's my sponsor? Like, what does that mean? He said, well, new rules, right? I'm the speaker chair. You have to, you have, to have a sponsor oh. to, uh, to speak. So I was pretty frustrated because I had known that this guy came to the program underage and I never outed him for it. What does that mean, underage? Under 18, which in this program they, you don't have. Oh, and I didn't out him for it. I'm like, wow, like, you're the rule breaker. And now you're, <laughs> and, and now suddenly you're, you know, giving me rules, right? A lot of resentment builds up and everything oh, else. So I turned to this guy who I was friendly with in program and I said, would you, would you say you are so I can do the first step? <gasps> and he said, well, not exactly, but I'll meet with you about it. I'll meet with you about it. We can talk about it. Okay. But first thing, don't pick that date. Let's set the date together. And then he and I started talking for many months. Please tell me he became your and sponsor. And he became my sponsor. Yes. Like slowly kind of slid into that role. I love that. You know, eventually, you know, we were meeting. We started meeting once a week. And You're like, one of those, I like, think questions. you are my sponsor. So, so what is this? So we're doing all this hanging out. Like, are we a thing? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, let's call <laughs> it. Let's call let's it. Let's call what it is. Wow. Yeah, so, I just want to see. so he, you know, kind of slid back in. And during that period, I was able to separate between the, the beautiful messages that I got from this mm. guy and the sponsor I mentioned, like today, he, he's since passed. And oh. today, I only have warmth for him. Like despite, really? yeah, despite those stories and everything else, I see him as a Im very important part of my journey who taught me incredible things. Yeah. Very, very important. And at the same time, had his own challenges and proved to be very human. Yeah. And those do not, they don't, um, one doesn't take away from the other. Yeah, that's amazing that you're able to do that. So, I mean, I was forced to, kind of like you, you said. And um, I realized the damage from putting someone on a pedestal. Gabor Mate never told anyone that he belongs on a pedestal. He just said that he found certain ideas that were helpful to him. So he started talking about it. And a lot of other people found those ideas helpful to them. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and they kept talking about it. Yeah. And... Uh, he gets invited back and eventually is encouraged to write a book, and that's all. But we didn't go to him for fitness advice or political advice or, or anything else. And even so, even if we did, let's say we found out that Gabor Mate was drinking every month. It doesn't make a difference. Right. It's, yeah. We're putting someone on a pedestal, and we're disappointed that they're yeah. not who we, yeah. who we think they are. That's not, that's not their problem. Yeah. But also, there are so many people that are like so excited that he's pro-power. You know what I mean? It's not like he let everybody down. There's a side of people that are like super pumped. So oh, for sure. It's not yeah. like he did something that was bad, right? Like, you know, like acting out like your sponsor, where it's just like there's no two sides. Like this is his opinion. Sure. Okay. Does that make sense? Right. But while it makes sense, not to the person who disagrees. On this issue, someone who disagrees sees the position as harmful. So the, the damage is the same, meaning what someone has to work through is the same. I think so. It's but equally think disappointing it's... because to someone who sees, why is the Israel-Palestinian issue so hard to solve? Because we take it so personal. Right, because right. someone's position is like, this is it, this is the right. truth, that's it. Right. Like, right, right, right. It's final, the same way, meaning the same conviction you have around my sponsor doing the wrong thing, someone is holding that same conviction around Gabor Mate. Right, 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 right. So while you're standing back and saying, hey, that's an opinion, it's not obviously wrong, but that's not the experience right, right. of the person who, that's true. of all the people who looked up to him for years and then found out. Like, Are they heartbroken? I know a lot of people are struggling very much to- Do they sit like Shiva? 
this, Sorry. I, I, I imagine it depends. So I can tell yeah. you in my, with my story, with my sponsor, it was incredibly, oh, incredibly I, that would, are we allowed to curse on this? Sure. Yeah. That would fuck me up for days. If my, if I found out my sponsor had been drinking and, and sponsoring me, I would not, it's like basically what your sponsor was doing. It was yeah. just lying. Yeah. Yeah. The whole program sure. is based on honesty. If we can't be honest with you have nothing. It's true. At the same point in time, he taught me some things. And I, I think wow. that, you know, likely he did have long periods of sobriety and he did learn a lot and he struggled. He struggled yeah. tremendously. Yeah, I know a lot of people that struggle with that. So, with that program. It's not a pass. I mean, I, I still, I don't feel bad that I was the one to hold him accountable, that I had tough meetings with him, that I was the one who brought it to the meeting, that maybe he shouldn't continue, that we ended they, up having a yeah, meeting. Yeah, they don't kick people out, I feel like. In this case, he did. They did? They kicked him and out? And two meetings split. People didn't disagree, and the meeting split over this. Oh, and I don't wow. feel bad that I was the one to, to bring it to the, to the surface that I said, hey, like, he's got to be held accountable for this. At the end of the day, it was inappropriate, and it hurt more than one person and repeated. And, you know, yeah, yeah I, I did think it was necessary. But still, as I worked through it, I realized that the issue was more with me than with him mm. and that I put him on the pedestal. He never asked to be. Yeah. In fact, he every single meeting he said he was powerless and he was mm. an addict. Mm -hmm. And he reminded me continuously of it. Yeah. And then when I found out that his in those ways he didn't lie at all. <laughs> right? Yeah. He, didn't lie he at was all. powerless. Yeah, he was powerless and he was wow. an addict. And in that yeah. way he didn't lie at all. Yeah. Wow. So there was another part that were lies, absolutely. But the fact that it shattered my image. So fully, it's because I, I was normal. desperate to have someone on a pedestal, of course. I think that's normal, I was desperate though. to have someone on a pedestal. So today, yeah. I try so to put people. Put I try to put people on the pedestal. See, that's that why dangerous. we're sitting on the floor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think that influenced my view of the the Gabor Mate. Okay, that's helpful. Sure. You had that experience already of like, wow, that feels a little messed up, but I can work through it and not throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing. Right. right. Yeah. I don't have experience with that. I'm very black and white. It's like uh, yeah. one of the Buddhists say, all suffering comes from attachment, right? Mm, so if we mm -hmm. attach this individual, yeah. attach the idea of this individual. Yeah. Yeah. So the more we can let go of, the less, the less suffering. Yeah. I try to do that every day. What? I try to do that every day, like in my journaling. Like, show me where you want me to be today. I don't know what today is supposed to look like. Now, right now? No, I'm oh. saying like in the morning when I start my oh, day, right. I'm like, I don't want to have, I used to be so rigid and structured and like, this has to happen. And it's just like, now I'm like, what is it going to look like? God, show me, you know? Right. So like, I have less attachment to the outcome. Right. That dovetails well with what you said earlier about in um, addiction, you can think that life gets kind of boring on the other side of right. it. Right. But right. it's just the opposite. Yeah. Addiction is the boring one. Cause yeah, because so you know every day you're drunk by 4 p.m., you're yeah. hungover, you're throwing up, and then you're drinking more, right. and then you wake up and you're like, fuck, I did it again. Or some variation, and then yeah, you may go through a three-day purge where, okay, I'm yeah. not touching anything, and then... You I up. never did, I'm not touching anything. Oh, really? That's the kind of alcoholic you I You didn't was. purge? Never. What is, I, I just, you had to drink every day. I didn't skip a day, ever. <laughs> well, right, because... I just didn't, it was legal. Like, why are you going to tell me not to drink? Why does it bother you? Like, that was my attitude. Like, am I hurting you? No. I was so angry, <laughs> so angry. Oh my God, poor girl. I think about her a lot because <laughs> like I'm just not the same person, you know? It's so crazy. There's still a little bit of that anger though. No. No? No. Okay. Okay. Fine. I wanted to do the Larry David. Um... <laughs> no, I've worked on it. I've worked on it. I had right. to like get angry and like learn that I could feel it. It's right. so deep. Have you ever right. done somatic therapy? I've done a lot of somatic therapy. But isn't um, plant medicines a lot of way is somatic therapy? I'm not doing Breath it. No, I'm not saying. I'm, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying you asked yeah, me yeah. if I've done it. Yeah. In a lot of ways. So that's I've been what seeing someone for like a year now. She's cha She's elevated my healing. I don't even know what she does, honestly, because it's weird to promote it because I don't even know what we do. We just, we get on the phone. She lives here actually, but I've been seeing her while I was living in New York. And she releases energies to things that I've been holding on to even before I was born that were like stuck in my body. She's amazing. Right. I'll give you her number. She's amazing. She's from, and I love that because she like Davins before she works on me. She's like, Hashem, thank you for giving me this gift. Please help me to heal Khani Lisbon. Help her to have a refuah. Like, I don't know. I just love it. 
So good. So let's let's go there in terms of your uh, your journey with Judaism. Oh, Judaism. Yeah, my mother's Jewish. My father's Jewish. I'm Jewish. Right. Um, I grew up, I thought that would get a harder <laughs> hit. It's fine. I, we're gonna, I'm sure from the audience. Yeah, yeah. they're going to be like, oh my God, I had no idea. Her name's Hani. She's Jewish. <laughs> um, so I grew up in a very, very, very strict household. My father was a rabbi and the, the, the rigidity was just like insane. I, I mean, if I give you details, you'd be like, there's no fucking way that's true. You mean? Okay. Pajama pants. No, 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 I had to put on a skirt over my pajama pants to walk to the bathroom to go to the bath, like in the middle of the night, like just like insane. Um, and when I started drinking, I, 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 so for when I was younger, I actually felt safe with that structure because my home life was chaotic. So I was like, oh, if I do this, I'll be safe. If I do this, when I started drinking, I put religion down, picked up vodka, and then was like, I don't need religion. Right. So I had to like find a new connection to God. It was like a whole thing. A few religion meant a ton of structure. Well, my new structure was the program. Right. When I got mean, sober. Religion didn't necessarily mean God. Religion just meant a lot of structure, a lot of rules. Yeah, I was like, I don't, right. I don't care. You know, I remember the first time I like put on makeup on Shabbos and I was like, the house didn't burn down. Okay, what happens if I turn the light on? You know, like I was just like, <sighs> yeah. Have you ever turned a light on on Saturday? It's a big deal. If you're brought up the way that no, I'm no, brought no, up I... and then you just turn it on, it's like the first time I went into a car on Chavez, I had a panic attack, full on panic attack. I made the cab driver like take me back to the hotel. I was like crying. I, I, was, I was 21 years old. I no, was an right. adult. I don't know. I know I've used very similar expressions to describe my journey yeah. as I was leaving it that I was surprised I didn't explode. Yeah, like yeah. I, when I had milk and meat together in the first bite, I threw up after. I was like, I can't do that. I said, well, now I don't eat milk and meat together, but um, now I'm pretty religious again. Right, so that's a part of the journey that I'm yeah. interested in, because when you spoke about where that question came from was when you were talking about this energy healer. Oh, yeah. So you had yes. said like, hey, she davens, and she davens Hashem, yeah. and she's religious, so your face lit up when you said that. Yeah. So I said, let's talk about your journey with Judaism, yeah. because it's not... So yeah, obvious it's me. not yeah. obvious at all. Um, I, at three years sober, I had um, memories of trauma that came to me for the first time. And um, it was really, really, really rough. I thought I was going to drink. I was also in a relationship with someone that at the time, oh, how do I make this relevant? How do I bring it back to God? Hold on one second. Something kept me sober during that year. It was v something kept me. I wanted, I actively wanted to not be feeling my feelings. Something kept me sober. Um, and then I was dating someone who wasn't Jewish. We were living together. And after a while, I wasn't happy in the relationship, but I also realized I wanted to be with somebody who was Jewish. And that became very important to me. And I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with this person. Right. And then I was like, no, actually, this is, I want someone who's Jewish. And then I, I broke up with them. And then since then has been my journey of like, what do I want? And it turns out every Friday night, I want to be at a Shabbos meal. Turns out, had no idea. I don't do comedy on Shabbos. I don't work on Shabbos. Like, I don't know, something shifted. It was very slow. I found amazing people in Crown Heights who like welcomed me in. I would show up to their house in pants. And I'm like, wait, I could be here in pants on Shabbos? Like, are you kidding? Like, it was a big deal for me. I always had to put on a skirt and cover my elbows and cover my knees and they were like, just come. We're so happy you're here. I don't care. Your phone's in your pocket. That's fine. I went to show. I was wearing pants and no one kicked me out. I was like, wait, what? I could do that? So I found people that let me be who I am while searching for God. And that has been monumental. Like two years ago, I decided I want to kosher my kitchen. I don't know where it came from. Oh. I was like, I want to be able to feed my family when they come over. And I want a kosher kitchen. So I, you know, Chabad.org, you know, da, da, da. Some guy came in. He koshered my kitchen. Neat. Four years ago, I would have been like, you're insane. I'm eating treif. Why would I need a kosher kitchen? And since doing that? I, I stopped eating non-kosher meat. I, um, I don't know. I just something, my body told me I was done. Shake Shack was my last uh, meal. <laughs> Shake Shack chicken sandwich, fried chicken sandwich. I have no idea. But my body just was like, I don't want it anymore. I could be starving for days. I won't, it's not, it's not an option. The same way alcohol isn't an option. 
and I don't know where that, that, there we go, the pintaliyid, right? It just, it's there, and I'm in touch with it. And for me, that's like a bottom line. Right. I think it does, um, you know, what's the, what's one of the promises in recovery is we'll not forget our past, nor no, we'll shut, shut the door on it. Right. Yeah. So I think that connects also to our heritage and to our past. Yes. Our religion, that as part of our healing journey, we, we come back around in some way. Yes. Not completely necessarily, right? I mean... Yeah, I mean, I, I still, you know, I dress like this right. and I'll never not dress like this. But, but in a way that validates you being born into it and raised into it in some way. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that was not a meaningless part of my life. Yeah. Which I, I, I think that's something I wrestled with for a while. Was I was giving so much meaning to everything that happened. And I said to myself, well, is there any meaning in the fact that I grew up religious, that I grew up Chabad? Because at this at that point in time, I wasn't keeping anything. Mm-hmm. I think the one mitzvah that was keeping me connected was tzedakah, right? I was giving charity. But other than that, I was completely disconnected. And I was giving charity to Jewish causes. But outside of that, I was completely disconnected. And How did you... I mean, you're wearing a yarmulke right now. Is that... Yeah, the yarmulke I started a few years ago. It was mostly in response to anti-Semitism. It wasn't about... I thought you were going to say balding. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't... Sorry. I'm projecting. Anti-Semitism. I, I, I did lose my hair three I times. I know. That's why so I made that's, that joke. So that was the not, projection. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I would not have made that joke if I didn't know you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I did have alopecia <laughs> three times, yes. and then my hair grew back. So I thank Hashem every morning for my hair. Yeah. But it actually, Anyways, I yeah. actually do like it better with the balding, but that's it. Yours or mine? No. Oh. <laughs> the yarmulke. Got it. <laughs> oh, wait. I want to say something about since October 7th. I have never felt so proud to be a Jew since October 7th. Something, it ignited in me. I'm like, I will die, al Kiddush Hashem. I don't care. Like, I never knew I was that proud. I always was like, yeah, I like having freed, you know, I'll sing him in the shower, whatever, you know. But like now, I'm just like, come at me. I don't care. Yeah, I it makes sense to, to me. That. I, I, f- I feel the same way. So in 2020, there was a lot of anti-Semitism going I didn't that. really tap into it. I don't know where I was. Where was I? This was when COVID. I, I know. Well, how come I don't? People are like, yeah, 2020. I'm like, did something happen in 2020 besides for COVID? There was literally anti-Semitism? There was the, the murder in the, in the shul in Muncie. wasn't there in Rockland oh, County. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of protests with a lot of very... yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Negative towards Israel, negative towards Jews, which is a lot uh, going on. Okay. I, I think I, I just saw, like, zoned out. I remember where I, I saw some politician recommend to Jews just to be a little bit less obvious. I was like, wow. You know, and I grew up as a Less Jew, obvious. Less obvious. And I grew up going to France because my, my mom is French-Moroccan. Yeah. So her parents and all of her siblings lived in France <laughs> and we'd go visit from time to time. And I was always advised as a kid, don't wear your yarmulke. If I put a cap, I, you know, as let's say an eight or 10 year old, I was able to hide the fact that I was Jewish. I was like, okay, so what does my dad do when he comes? You know, wow. you can't really hide that. But in any case, and so I kind of wondered about that. Like, okay, it's great that some of us can hide it, but for many people, they can't. Right? Yeah. The rabbi with kapata walking to shul on Shabbos can't, uh, wow. can't hide that fact. But in any case, when I saw it, I, I accepted it as a child in France. And I was like, okay, that's Europe. And I experienced a little bit of it because I went to school in England um, for a year. And any time we went out of the immediate little community in Manchester, the Jewish community, we had some interaction. Like people would say things? Whether they would say things or oh. fights or it was some yeah. interaction. Yeah. Um, I was walking with a friend in a mall and his hat, got knocked, his hat got knocked off. And then, you know, I grabbed it back and this guy punches me and I expected, you know, what happens in Crown Heights? You get into a fight with someone and an old black woman comes to your rescue. Yeah. Right? So right. let me make a little noise. And I'm like, wow, in England, there's no... Nobody cares. Yeah, no one cares. Wow. <laughs> Shit. So uh, there was a lot. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in, in, um, in England. And I knew about it in France as well. When I was in England in Yeshiva there, there was no... I couldn't hide it anymore. There was no, I had the beard. I had yarmulke. If I put a hat on, it wasn't... Yeah. The white shirt, the black Yeah, hat. it's very... No, your tzitzis also were just like... We're done. <laughs> yeah. And... When I heard that, I, I, I tried finding where this politician said it, but when I heard this, it woke up something inside me and saying, like, America can't become Europe. So I was like, I got to put on a, a yarmulke. America is nicht anders. <laughs> <laughs> like, we, cannot, we can't go to that place. And it felt to me so obvious that we should wear, just make it obvious. Yeah, I think if I was a guy, I would 100% be wearing a yarmulke and sitsis these days. Both. <laughs> yeah. Out. Sitsis out. 
I have friends who were not keeping Shabbos or kosher before October 7th. Sits us out. Shabbos, no phone, no nothing. Yeah, I had a meeting in a non-kosher restaurant a few weeks ago after October 7th. It was just after October 7th. Like, I'm not taking off my yarmulke. Yeah. No way. And how did the, me- how did the meeting that. go? I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what to... Oh, it was fine. They, you know, I got a little bit of a look, but I explained. Right? It's so crazy. They how... were all Jewish, right? Oh. It was fine. They were... So then what's the... Because the restaurant wasn't, so I'm walking in with that. Obviously, oh. you get a bunch of looks. And I, I thought about, should I do this? Should I not? Well, is it... You know, will someone think that maybe it's kosher because I want the yarmulke walking in? So oh, I haven't okay. done it since, but at that moment, I kind of felt like... Mara Sion. I don't know what it was. I, I'm kidding. I don't... It could be confusing for yeah. someone, so I've chosen not to since then, but that was where... But that was the pride like. of like, yeah, I'm Jewish. Don't make me put it in my pocket. Yeah, when someone says, oh, you know, yeah. what can I do to support Jews? I'm like, wear a yarmulke. Like, make it more obvious. Make it... Yeah. You know, I love Hanukkah for that because Hanukkah was... Yeah. Like, you know, super proud. The Menorah. What? Menorah, it's my favorite holiday also. Right, there's something Monica. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're about to have another holiday. When is they win the war? Sorry. Oh, that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I hope, I'm assuming your listeners are pro-Israel. That would be really funny if they're all Palestinian listeners and they're mad at what I just said. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm assuming sure. that we're going to yeah, win. Yeah, I think you're fine. If I get canceled again, I need to get a little bit more. But maybe even if they do hear that, maybe they've also heard what we said about Gabor Mate and being able to separate. Yeah, maybe they can separate themselves and still, you know, come to my comedy show. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Even though... That uh, would be helpful. You know, when I met Gabor Mate, one of the questions I asked him was... Will you adopt me? No, that's not what you said. Was, I said that I have a number of Orthodox Jewish listeners and I don't want them to lose your message just because you said some anti-Israel things. So what advice would you give someone on how to still be able to retain your message despite the fact that there are obvious disagreements? What did he say? Um, he kind of went to two different places. First, he showed respect for the, for the question. Wow. I mean, so that's he respects the question, question. respects yeah. the openness of it. And then he kind of w- went in two directions. One was um, like part of the Jewish way is questioning and challenging. So always having an open mind is good. But then he kind of pivoted from there towards, and if you have an open mind and you understand the Palestinian situation, then you will see it the way I do, where you know he kind of dug his heels in on the point. But I think the first part of his answer was perfectly, I actually answered the question. The second became um, a speech on, on um, Palestine. But what was interesting, one, one thing I will say for those who are confused is that what impressed me about Gabor Mate over the, the weekend that I spent with him because we did an interview and then I, I went to a workshop of his, which was a fairly small workshop, so there was wow. plenty of interaction. Wow. And he said, and what impressed me was the way he listened mm. and the way he learned. And I realized that he's not a good teacher, he's a good student. Like that's his, to me, his gift. And it felt to me that that openness wasn't there on the um, Israel subject. There was a certain anger that would set in and rigidity. And for example, just as one example of that is, he guessed my views on, on Israel because I was wearing a yarmulke. And he assumed that my views are the same as, I didn't, haven't heard the guy's name at the time, but you know, Ben Gvir or Baruch Goldstein, or I don't, I don't know if they're in the same category or not, but he did. He put them. Baruch Goldstein is the... Um, you know Baruch Hosea. No, I was going to pretend, but I have no idea. So in the 90s, he went into a mosque and shot up um, oh. a bunch of... He, he went into a mosque and shot up a bunch of random... Oh, so he thought you were on the So same. he assumed, I guess, wearing a yarmulke, like, oh, you probably support Baruch Goldstein. I'm like, where I grew up, Baruch Goldstein was viewed as a terrorist. Yeah. You know? I, said, I think it's telling that you had to go back 30 years to pull an example, and we can't go 30 days on the other side. And to that, he responded that um, Israel has the power. Right, so they have the responsibility, which well, I don't want to get, get into all that, but my point is is that on that issue, I didn't see the same openness that he has on other, for whatever reason. Interesting. For, for whatever reason, his particular life journey yeah. um, or trauma. I would actually else. love to hear more about why he's so on that side. Like it doesn't even make sense. I do but, think yeah. he's bringing up an important point. I do think. I, I think that there has been a tendency on um, 
I, I hear it often on the Jewish side, that feels like a dehumanization of the Palestinians. Not across the board, and I don't think it's Israel policy. I don't think, yeah. you know, in a democracy, you're, you're not going to, to, to get that because if someone is too far, too far on that side, enough people aren't going to vote for, right. for, for them. Um, so I don't think it's Israel's policy, but you do hear a lot of that. And I feel like that's some of what he's, he's trying to raise awareness towards is like do not de- dehumanize the other side once you dehumanize the other side then you're giving permission for them to dehumanize you and then you're only left with an argument of jews are better right like that's yeah once you go to dehumanization then the only thing you can go to is the nazi argument there's one race better than the other race so now we're so i, th- I think he is calling attention to that and Possibly that's what's frustrating him, and he's just doing it a little bit too strongly, seeing some elements of that within um, within the Jewish people, and he's saying, like, come on, wake up. You can't dehumanize the other side. That is Nazi-like, you know? So he's, mm. but I th- feel like I he's taking that. it, a, I think he's taking it a little bit too far because there's something that's bothering him so much yeah. um, about it. I think the other side is that um, from political ideologies, I, I think he, I didn't ask him, but I think he would describe himself as a communist. And oftentimes that view is anyone who has took, anyone who doesn't have was taken from. So the, the person who has more, the person who's more powerful is always wrong in the equation. Someone is rich, they're, they're a bad guy. Yeah. Someone is poor, they're a good yeah. guy. That view is kind of across the board. Because when I discussed it with him, the only real thing he can tell me was that Israel had more power. I'm like, okay, but if the other side had more power, certainly Hamas, if they had more power, then Israel wouldn't exist. You know, there would be nothing. So uh, I'm not sure how you can yeah. say that the person with power is always right. is, is always wrong. But it's just so meaning it felt like a political ideology mixed in overlaying his view of the world. Mm. But I think that within his words, I did hear an important message for Jewish people is that we cannot dehumanize the Palestinians. And I think that yeah. is an important, um, an important point. I agree. When I hear his son, Daniel Mate, I feel like he's took it a little bit, like a little bit further than, uh, than his father. That's what it feels like to me. I've watched his stuff and it's almost like a, a vendetta, you know? Oh, wow. We're like, Jews bad. Not, not Jews. He wouldn't say that, God forbid. He would say, Zionist bad, um, Israel bad. Got it. Palestinians good, which is, come on, there's, there's good yeah. and there's bad on both mm-hmm. sides. I mean, we can't. Yeah, I'm going to check him out like, after this. Ooh. I want to see. His son. Yeah. Let's see some of his stuff. Right, like I, I, can't, um, I can't pull the same um, like goodness from his words that I'm able to hear from, from his dad. From his dad's. Got it. Yeah, I feel like he took it one step, one step further. But anyway, those are just my... Um, thoughts why did i yeah maybe i felt it was kind of incomplete for a listener okay so how do you how do you reconcile this it's yeah. kind of how i reconcile some of the some of the ideas but i did find like i said that he didn't quite listen as carefully around that with everything else on my thoughts on trauma my thoughts on my thoughts on trauma he was like he's the expert he so oh okay yeah he wanted to hear what i had to say but on israel he knew what i knew you right? know he, he thought he knew what i was going to say so i'm like okay that part so it was like defensive almost right that which suggests to me that that part is not healed right and that's fine uh, he doesn't pretend to be perfectly healed yeah, yeah he speaks about you know his own trauma his own addictions and that's one of the things that people love yeah. about him is that he's been so open yeah about his own uh his own yeah. process it's cool and we can see it in someone else we're like oh that part we just we just <laughs> hit a nerve <laughs> right yeah yeah and i yeah, some of us have pulled off a pedestal because they still have some, some stuff. Mm. I feel like there's something incomplete on the ayahuasca conversation. Really? Yeah. Do you have ayahuasca? Are, we, are you supposed to try it at the end of this episode? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, some tea. No. Oh, okay, that's what. Okay, this is what I want to ask you. Okay, more point because you said my sponsor would never be. A, my sponsor would never be okay with it. Oh, yeah. Right. Which I'm fine. I'm fine with. I'm not hearing anything in your story that's, um, that you're suffering. But, 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 but. I did have a conversation with someone once, which, and this one did bother me because they were in a very difficult place in their life. 
very, mm. very difficult place in their life. They were sober for a bunch of years. They had sponsored many people. Um, but they weren't in a good place, and their kids were in an especially bad place, which to me is, as a father, you kind of, I would hope that anything that happened in my family, I would take responsibility for at some point. Yeah. Right? That would be yeah. part of the ownership within in the program. So he's struggling, his kids are struggling, and someone put him in touch with me. He was actually calling me about one of his children, but then when I was talking to him, I pointed it back to him, right? Okay. As the father, and it's with his other kids as well. Like, hey, maybe there's something here. And I wasn't getting anywhere. So I said to him, I said, um, I think that, you know, maybe you should consider plant medicines. Maybe it, it affords someone a new perspective on different situations. Mm. And he asked some questions about it. And then he shut it down immediately, saying, my sponsor wouldn't okay it. Mm. So I said, okay, I, I hear that, but things aren't working. Right. Right. Like, right. how is this not? Yeah, no, I do know. Actually, I just remembered. I have a weird memory since COVID. I do know someone who's in the program who was doing um, with her therapist. Um, you mentioned it earlier. It's, Ketamine? Yes. Right. And she's still, you know, sober. So, right. I mean, I guess there are people that do it. But did he end up doing it? No, or he, no? no he didn't end up doing it. Uh, and I, I guess oh, but my you're saying you is, felt like he actually wanted to. Yeah, my so I, I just kind of want a piece of, no, not that he wanted to. I know he wanted to. I felt that he needed something desperately, and he was shutting it down. But did he find another solution? Not last I spoke to him, no. That's and sad. many months later, right? So that's, yeah. that, that's what I'm saying. Meaning yeah. the same way that I would challenge someone who would tell me, Hasidus has all the answers. Tanya has all the answers. It may very well, but you haven't found them in there because your life is miserable. Mm, mm -hmm. So I, I go look for other solutions. Yeah. And if you're finding someone who has a lot of the things that you want, which is the best way to heal, find something who has what you want yeah. and ask them how they did it. So if you find someone who has that and they've used alternative methods to learning Tanya, then embark on that path. Otherwise, you're turning this I don't know, to me, you're desecrating it, right? You're, this is, at the end of the day, does God want this suffering? Like, is this the purpose of it? So you're saying, oh, Tanya has the answers, Tanya has the answers. You have not figured out how to find the answers there. Mm. So go somewhere else. Keep, you know, keep going. Stop keep searching. Yeah, keep searching. Stop suffering. Stop suffering unnecessarily. And I would say the same thing to someone in program. It's, okay, program is everything. It's got you sober. Okay, I get it. It gave you something beautiful, but your life is not doing well now. Right. Keep looking. I'm not saying this has to be the answer, but to shut it down so categorically feels like we replaced one yeah. dogmatic view of the world for another. So I just, that's, I guess my question is. Well, I did have experience with, you know, in my mind, like program was supposed to answer all, all be, like be the end all and be all, be all, how's it? And, and be all and all, and be, all, be, yeah. be all and end all. You guys understand. And, um, I needed outside help. I needed to get on medication for my anxiety. And I refused because I was like, no, I had a very bad experience with being on the wrong medication. And that's why my hair fell out. So I was like, I'm not getting on medication. I will suffer through. And I finally surrendered like a year and a half ago. I was like, I'm ready. And so there, you can't work a step to get out of, if I have like a, you know, a physical imbalance in my brain, you know, and since then it's been great. Right. I found a medicine that works, a psychiatrist that's amazing. Like, I wasn't going to get this kind of relief so from isn't the program. isn't that mind-altering? I'm saying from a program perspective, isn't that mind-altering? Um, no, I don't think so. It's not, it's not considered. I mean, I know there's one group who, like, I think you're not allowed to take medication. But this is, you know, it's just like a little Prozac. And it's controlled. And I'm on, like, a super low dose. So it's not like... I'm not. Yeah, yeah, it sounds I'm, like I'm getting attacked. No, I'm just kidding. No, what I'm saying is, is earlier you said the rule is. Yeah, but like I'm saying things, like no shrooms or, you know what I mean? I know a lot of people that are on medication and that's fine. That's considered kosher. Got it, understood. Yeah. Okay, so I would yes, like. Yes, I'm on Prozac and I love it. Right. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> First I, used, love? I used to have so much anxiety. So I don't is, have it okay, anymore. So this, is, this is in recovery for years and years so and years. Exactly, and I'm struggling and I'm like, I can't live like this. So this is exactly why I went to plant medicines. The reason why I went to plant medicines, I was sober. Things were good. I was happy. I got married. I, got, I had a couple of kids. Business was doing well. Life was good. But I had this anxiety that I absolutely could not kick. Yeah. I was like, there's got to be something better. Yeah. There's got to be something better. And yeah. I totally identify with it. I would wake, my anxiety would wake me up before my alarm clock. 
for years. Just like anxious stomach aches, like nervous. Everything made me so nervous. And now I'm like 10 milligrams and I'm like, dee, dee, dee. you know, right. that's all I needed was just like a little tweak and it's fine. Right. So, right. So my question would be 10 milligrams every day or three cups of ayahuasca three times. Interesting. I'm going to stick with this. I'm not saying, yeah. I'm not talking about you. I'm not yeah. talking about you. I'm talking about the, the concept. Meaning the concept, the, yeah. If something's working, you say you're happy, everything's good. Yeah. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the, the, the idea, the figurehead of the person in recovery who wants to abide by the principles of recovery, but is, you're, you're trying to do everything. And you're journaling, and you're waking up, and you're putting your phone away, and you're praying yeah. to God, and you're, you know, you're hitting your knees, you're praying, you're sponsoring, you're sponsored, but you have this anxiety. Yeah. So you go to one group, and they tell you, no, 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 nothing. And you're like, nothing? So what, I'm going to live with this forever? Yeah. And another one says, 10 milligrams Prozac, as long as the doctor says, okay, fine, beautiful. I'm, I support that 100%. So I'm saying for that figurehead, that person in recovery, what would be the difference between 10 milligrams every day? 15, I just remembered. <laughs> so sorry. A little bit of Prozac every day forever or several cups of ayahuasca. For the person in recovery, not for you, like what would change? Yeah. Why would I one be the, I don't know. different than the other? I don't actually know the answer to that. Right. I don't. And I'm actually going to call my sponsor later and find out. Like, I just don't right. know. Because I think ayahuasca is new, newer, right? So it wasn't around back then. It wasn't even a thing. People are just like, oh, no, no. You know, but like, I don't right. know what the actual like commentary is and like why it's so awful. Like, I don't know. Also, I've never done it. I don't have experience with it. I have, most of my friends have tried it. Not most, a lot. Right. I was trying to brag that I know people, but it's <laughs> fine. Um, yeah. But here's the thing. For me as like a person, I'm, it's, even if I was allowed to, I still wouldn't. Like, I have no desire. I'm not talking about you because I you're know. happy. I'm saying I'm so if, happy. It's disgusting. If your life wasn't working. Yeah. And you were reaching out to me and saying, hey, I can use some help. And I said, hey, why don't you try this? And you were shut off. Then, I, yeah, then I'd be poking. So I'm not talking about right. you. I'm talking about right. the blanket. I'm, I'm challenging not you, the right. blanket just rules the you said. Yeah, I don't I mean, know. You said, oh, it's mind altering. So I'm like, okay, it's in Prozac mind altering. Like, yeah. It's just a little bit I every don't day. Think Prozac and, is mind altering. Is it mind altering? It's altering something. Yeah. It wouldn't you be, you wouldn't you be, you should see me. You wouldn't be altered. If not yeah. Right. So doing something. Yeah. Right. No, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I don't think that's a basis for it. You know, I'll tell you a, a recovery story, I like to say. It's from the same individual who I told you about with the, um, who was struggling with him and his kids, but refused to Got it. look at anything that his sponsor didn't say was okay. Like, imagine your sponsor didn't okay Prozac. I mean, just, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how you feel now? I would get another sponsor. Okay. So he, okay. So he told me a story. <laughs> Right, so he told me a story, and he said that he had a sponsee who um, had a little bit of kiddush one Friday night, oh. and he wanted to know. I don't know what happened. I think it was like at a Rebbe's tish or something, and some wine came around, and he had a little bit. It was there was something there, and it would have been a pretty big deal not to take any. So he took some, and then he went to his sponsor a little bit later, and he's like, "Hey, I did this. Is it a relapse? Yes or no?" So he's like, I went to my grand sponsor and my great grand sponsor and everything else. And finally, we got the verdict. And the verdict was, you relapsed. So I said to him like this. I said, why, instead of that, and I, I hear all this, why, why don't you let the story tell you whether he relapsed? Because what's the theory? The theory is that if I took something, if, 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 if I took a drug that's problematic to me, it's already happened. I'm not saying for the future. That would become very yeah. dangerous. But here... We, have, we need the great grand sponsor to issue his verdict from above of what it is and what it isn't, you know, as if Bill W., who was the founder of this whole thing, as if he wasn't challenged later on. Yeah, he, he was on, he's on drugs. You're calling it drugs. He was using medicines. Oh, he, he was, was using medicines? Yeah, he was using LSD to heal. And he's like, we wow. got to bring this back to the program. This is amazing. Right, the same way you would talk about Prozac. And you're like, wow, if you have anxiety, you can still do a little bit of this. So he found deeper yeah, healing yeah, yeah. through this, and he said, hey, this should be part of the program. But this was 30 years after AA was already, you know, started, right. and he had no say at that point. So why would I call the great, great grand sponsor hoping that he had the, the answers? So my recommendation to him is, now that's already happened, just tell your sponsee, we're going to find out. 
If it wasn't a relapse, then you'll probably be okay. The allergic reaction won't hit you, and you'll be sober, and then it won't have been a relapse. But if you relapse, then we'll know that it started then. Right? So my oh, point genius. right? My point is, I, th- I think it's maybe kind of the theme of this conversation of not putting people on pedestals, not our sponsor, and not Gabor Mate, and not even um, ideas. Let's ideas hold up to the test of time. Could this idea withstand? Yeah. The, the test of time. Yeah. Could it or can't it? And to me, if the 12 steps is a solution for everything, then I would see someone who's completely solutioned. He has everything he needs. And if it's working, and in your case, it didn't get all the way there. That's no. why you add a little Prozac and you add a little somatic therapy. And in my case, it didn't get me all, all the way there. And I'm still a huge proponent of the 12 steps. And I find people um, using plant medicines a lot. And there's nothing that I want to tell them more than do the 12 steps. Mm. Addict or no addict, like yeah. What that framework will do to the plant medicine experience will catapult you to another stratosphere because these experiences aren't being brought down to reality because you've never been told, you've never been held accountable to an amends, you've never been held accountable to an inventory, you've never been held accountable yeah. to, any of, to, to any of these structures that this offers you. Does it solve everything? No. Like you had anxiety and anxiety yeah. after the fact, but it's a huge, huge, huge proponent. And I guess that's my message overall. And that's why I call this podcast in search of more. Just like, let's keep searching. Let's keep yeah. our mind open instead of shutting things down. This one's mind altering. This one's You're right. Avaita Zara. Yeah. This one's, this one's great. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. That's my, that's my pitch. Okay. Wonderful. Where do I buy the book? <laughs> I'll buy it. Yeah. Okay. I get we, have enough, we have enough time to get to the show. I mean, I need to order pizza. It's, it's not a joke. Can I recommend something else? Yes. An ice plunge. No, I need food in my body. An ice plunge before your show, you'll have. No, I need energy. food. I'm my, okay, my I'm sugar's not. starting to drop. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, do the food and the ice plunge. Okay. Yeah, the ice fine. plunge. Okay, I'm not going to do an ice plunge. Just okay, for fine. The record. I could, I'll teach you how to blow the bubbles first. Do you you go in, you have an ice plunge here? Yeah. Okay, fine. I'll do it. What? not gonna do it <laughs> okay strongly right. i have to go strongly, let's i'm go. so sorry to be rude i'm so happy to be here i, don't I had the best time i just like what were you concerned one about? of the comedians is already at the space i just have one question you were concerned before the mics went on that if this conversation went long you would lose energy yeah and what i said was if i did my job correctly you'll have more energy at the end of the conversation that is correct i do have more energy but i still need to that eat. is not rude thank you okay there we go thank you for having me